Hey there, humans. Here to talk about uh, John D. Caputo's The Insistence of God, a theology of perhaps, and uh, specifically uh, to talk about uh, this fourth chapter called Theopoetics as the Insistence of a Radical Theology. This uh, is a part of a uh, book blog tour over at Homebrew Christianity, uh, the illustrious and or uh, ridiculous homebrew Christianity. Um, you can check out a bunch of folks who are blogging their way through uh, chapter by chapter uh, this book. Uh, it has just been launched, Indiana University Press, um, part of the uh, Philosophy of Religion series with uh, Westfall, Merrill Westfall as editor. And uh, what I'm going to do uh, is uh, three things. I'm going to contextualize the book broadly in Caputo's uh, kind of trajectory. I'm going to talk specifically about um, this fourth chapter, which um, deals with theopoetics, which is something I've spent a lot of time thinking and working in. And then I'm going to zoom back out, um, talk about the book as a whole, and uh, ask a couple questions, and um, hopefully there'll be some feedback. So, um, without Further ado, um, John D. Caputo, uh, good friend of the Homebrew Christianity podcast, uh, and his book, The Insistence of God, A Theology of Perhaps. Okay, so first thing, contextualizing this book within the broader um, kind of trajectory of, of Caputo. So, um, as has been mentioned uh, in interviews with him before, there is a confessional, that is to say, uh, kind of doctrinally stable, relatively, um, uh, history to Jack Caputo. Um, he was an Aquinas scholar um, and was um, kind of studying for, I believe, the priesthood, although he certainly was kind of in the ranks of uh, kind of lay ministry in the Catholic Church. Maybe he was a, a monk. He was monk-esque. He was a monkalite. Um, but uh, Catholic. And um, has never, I think, really uh, shed the sense of, of Catholicism or, or more broadly Christianity, the Church Universal. I'm not sure. I would actually be doubtful if he goes to church on every Sunday, or, or rather, if he even goes to church at all regularly. Um, but maybe he does. I don't know. Um, but there's some part of his core conviction which is uh, in orbit around Christianity, around cultural Christianity, what it might mean. And um, he has kind of come... Uh, a long way from being a theologian in training, a Thomist, towards um, his radical hermeneutics and his work against ethics. Through the early 2000s, 2006, he publishes The Weakness of God, which is his first attempt at kind of a nearly theological text, and now it's full-blown. There's nothing closeted about this anymore. This is John D. Caputo, the Continental Philosopher of Religion, coming out as an attempted theologian. Now, there's a lot of contingencies regarding this uh, theologian Caputo. Uh, he talks about radical theology, but he doesn't mean by radical theology what a lot of other people who are consider themselves to be radical theologians means by radical theology. Uh, he talks about Christianity, but he doesn't mean by Christianity what a lot of other people mean by Christianity when they say Christianity. So the, the broad thesis of this text is that he wants to articulate what it would mean to have a theology of insistence as opposed to existence. Now, at the surface, this language just doesn't compute. If something is insisting, it must exist. If it doesn't exist, how can it insist? At a core level, if, if that's a problem for you, then this is not going to help you at all. So his notion of the idea uh, of an event is, well, uh, I'll quote it for you. Events, he says, 
we keep coming back to the event. But what are these events, exactly? Events do not exist. They insist. See, I told you this was going to happen. It is we who are called upon to give them existence. What are they calling? To what are we responding? By what are we addressed? For what do they call? To what are we saying yes? In what can we have a faith if it is not fixed in creedal terms? Events, we have been saying, have two characteristic features. First, events are what we cannot see coming. And secondly, events are not what happens, but what is going on in what happens. So an event is the sense of what is to come that is going on in what is happening. What is happening is what exists, while the event is what insists. What? So, in an event that we would, in commonplace language, refer to as an event, so um, anything that you can articulate that's an action that is observable in the world, the thing that is actually happening, the observable thing, that's to say, um, let's say I go to, I go to worship on Sunday morning. That's a specific thing. I do it on a regular basis, and when I do it, it's happening. It's an event. Um, Kaputa's going to say, no, 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 that's not an event. This is a technical term here. Okay, um, that's what's happening. What's happening is you, Khaled, are going to, to worship. Um, and all the things that we could say about that worship, where it is, why you think you're going, um, what other people think you're doing there, what you think they're doing there, any, any of those things that are, are kind of in the present moment, that's what's happening. That's religion. Um, and even though they're not concrete, right, they're my thoughts, they're what I think is about to happen, um, even though those are not uh, graspable as such, he said that's part of um, what's happening. The event is like the thing that undergirds that. The event is the thing, this is a Caputo's language here. Uh, the event is the thing that is harbored in the name of what is happening. So that's the thing that's making me always wonder. Could it be different? Might there be more here? Why am I doing this? Oh, I know why I'm doing this. It's the, it's the core, but not the core in the sense that if I tried hard enough, I could figure it out and pluck that nugget of wisdom out. Like, ah, now I get it. It's a, it's a kind of uh, right beyond the corner pulling forth. A lot of this is like the process theology notion of the way that God lures us non-coercively into the world. There's a way in which uh, Caputo is very resonant with process theology um, in, in method or, or flavor, but not in metaphysics, because uh, that is not a good word for Caputo. So the event is the, is the main attraction for Caputo here. And um, in this fourth chapter, um, he's talking about theopoetics as the insistence of a radical theology. And so uh, it's good to do some terminology here. So the way that Caputo uses the phrase radical theology um, is a very particular way. When he says radical theology, he, he means confessional theology becoming radical. Okay, so this is tricky. When we say radical theology, it sounds like he's talking about a thing. And instead, he's talking about another thing, that is confessional theology, moving towards radicality, being radical. So we're already kind of in motion here, which is great for someone who's thinking about the event. Okay, so one of the things that Caputo does in here that I think um, is interesting is that he sets up a structure um, of understanding uh, about the difference between confessional and radical theology as he kind of uses it. And then he uh, kind of further uses a couple typologies underneath radical theology to articulate what he understands to be going on. So um, confessional theology is, conf is theology done um, which is accountable to the church, whether it's the Catholic church or um, the Lutherans or your evangelical congregation or my Quaker community, whatever it is, the confessional theology is done kind of with a community in mind and specifically accountable to it in one way or another. Um, and so he says that's confessional theology. He says radical theology 
um, is influenced by postmodernity, and he doesn't think that postmodern thinkers, by and large, are Christian. He's not trying to make that claim, but he's saying that people who have paid attention to the things that Derrida have said, that Foucault have said, that Ricoeur have said, and are somehow uh, adopting or allowing that kind of movement in thought to influence their theological thinking, um, uh, well, um, they are becoming radical. Their confessional becoming radical, and therefore they could be talked about as radical theologians. And he says that of the radical theology that he's envisioning, there are uh, two types. So the first, which he skips over because he says it's uh, like postmodern entity light, um, is a, a hermeneutic approach to radical theology. And this is what he says. Um, hermeneutics in the general sense of Gadamer or Ricoeur presupposes the truth of the religious tradition or classic. Its enduring viability, its continuing power to fuel the tradition in ways that are ever-changing yet ever true to itself. The truth of the tradition does not lie in a changeless body of beliefs, but in changing but enduring form of life. Hermeneutics in the more radical sense, and by this he means deconstruction, um, or one way to think about deconstruction, is more dubious of such truth and in search of a more ruthless truthfulness. Here, of course, I think we should hear echoes of Nietzsche um, and, um, of course, also then Derrida and his difference. So, it's this second kind. It's kind of this ruthless truthfulness that um, Caputo is after. And he specifically um, is uh, in invoking Derrida's uh, notion of the secret. Uh, and, of course, the secret is that there is no secret. Um, this is going to sound very familiar to people who have been listening to Dave Fitch, uh, specifically in the end of evangelicalism, or have been listening to Pete Rollins more recently, um, and to Zizek, which of course is all to say it just to sound familiar to people who have been reading or thinking about Lacan, because to some degree this critique or this train of thought is very similar to uh, Lacan's idea of l'ogit petit a, um, and Caputo actually names that on uh, 84, saying that this, this, that we have this desire for something that uh, is is out in the world, but we can't name it. There's nothing there, right? That's the Derridian secret. There's nothing there, folks. Um, but it somehow calls to us nonetheless. Uh, it, it makes us um, want to do things. So this book is a theology of perhaps, and, and the reason this is relevant is perhaps is the thing that what lets loose the secret, right? So uh, if in hermeneutics, the hermeneutic approach, not the radical hermeneutics, but the, hermene the Gadamerian or Ricurian uh, hermeneutic approach to radical theology, um, the thing is not changing, right? So people are already going to, if you're, if you're more conservative or kind of fundamental or purely if there is such a thing, purely confessional about your theology, even the, what Caputo calls the theology light version of the Ricurian radical theology will be offensive to you. But if you're way out there, uh, Ricurian um, hermeneutical radical theology will still not be extreme enough for you. Uh, because somewhere underneath there, there's some notion of truth, even if it's changing or... Um, oh, movable or fluid and has some kind of uh, movement and capacity for alteration and change. It's not eternal the way that we think of it. It's not platonic. It's not a form. It's not fixed. Um, that's still not enough because we still think there's some truth out there. And Caputo is going to say, uh, I don't know about that. It seeks a more deconstructive version of postmodern theology, presupposing only what Derrida calls the secret where the secret is that there is no secret, as a capital S, no privileged access to the secret code. That explains everything. That produces a more challenging and truthful notion of truth, which has nothing to do with producing sophistry and confusion. It insists on the radical contingency of any historical tradition as an effect of the play of traces. Nowhere out there in this thing, is there a truth? There is no existence of truth. Instead, there is the insistence, the weak theology call, the ghost, 
the spook in the system that makes you wonder if there might be something more, or maybe maybe you should be doing less. It's it's never formed. He's very clear in this chapter. Radical theology, as he understands it, doesn't reside in a department. It's not going to ever have its own chair. It's not going to ever have its own conferences. It is the ghost of things that is underneath confessional theologians as they become radical, as they begin to think the things that they're not supposed to think if they're really being accountable to the system. It's even in scripture, he says. There are places where you read things that don't quite fit, and as you read it, you think, oh, uh-oh, it's radical theology. But we can't have a tradition based on that. And he doesn't even really want us to have a tradition based on it. He just wants us to be listening, I think, to, to the way that theology might sound if we paid more attention to those things that call us beyond what's appropriate within the confessional tradition. The things that call us beyond needing to have something be the case. The things that call us to ask a question, the answer to which might just be, perhaps... And how? How would a theology like this sound? Well, it would sound like a theopoetic. So, Caputo says, I will invoke theopoetics in order to explain the discursive shape, the grammatological genre required by radical theology. The radical and radical theology goes to the roots of classical theology and uproots them pulling up by the root the logos of the old theology and replacing it with a poetics, a poesis. In the process, it uproots its piety, its celestial demeanor, along with the mythological and quasi-gnostic drift of the logos, exposing it to the events that underlie and undermine it. Or, to put it another way, the old logos of theology is replaced with events, which are addressed by a poetics and not a logic. What he's calling us back to is a theology of the flesh, not um, of the external, not of the certainty beyond, um, of what he calls uh, Martha's world. It's the theology of the present, of the possibilities that are here. Not of promises, unless the promise is made but never finished. My appointed task in the present chapter is to weaken or dilute the old Lagos, which I here undertake under the flag of Theopoetics. This may be regarded as a kind of heart transplant in which the celestial and moribund Lagos of classical theology, always close to death, memento mori, its beat barely detectable, is replaced with a heartier Poetics. If the quasi-Gnostic tide is stemmed by redescribing the Lagos of theology as Theopoetics, the Poetics turns out to mean having a heart, a core inquietum, the unquiet heart, for the travails of the perhaps, which brings us to the circumfessional cut that, as I claim, is already described in confessional theology. If the logos is the tranquilizing agent, the poetics is the radicalizing agent, resulting not in the illogical, but the a-logical, the displaced logic, the specter of perhaps. Far from fearing one small word, Theopoetics presents its papers as the poetics of the perhaps. In radical theology, which is confessional theology becoming circumfessional, theology becoming theopoetics, the logic of transcendence is displaced by a poetics of the quasi-transcendental. But if a poetics is not a logic, neither is it an aesthetics, a poetics is not a theory of art or sensuous feelings. It is not a work of art and does not mean poetry, even as it does not mean falling back on feelings of dependence. A poetics is a discourse cut to fit what I have been calling the insistence of the event and as such provides a perfect candidate for the grammatology of the perhaps. So what's at stake, right? What, what, what is going on behind what's going on here? Well, I have, um, I have two, two thoughts on that. One is, he wants to do something that he's almost doing. No, maybe he's doing this on purpose, in which case, that's awesome. Or maybe he's just not there yet, and maybe he'll never be there, and that would be okay. I think he wants to matter. <laughs> I think he wants to matter to people... Um, other than uh, me. 
<laughs> he wants to matter to people in churches. He wants to matter to society. He wants this radical theology, the kind of this postmodern, um, post recurian post uh, Gadamerian, Deridian kind of perhaps ish theology to. I think, bleed into confessional theology. And he wants the confessional theologians to allow themselves to ask some questions that aren't appropriate for the confessions they're making. But he said, it can't be that radical theologians do their own thing and confessional theologians do their own thing. They must, he says, not simply pass each other as ships in the night. If radical theology does not exist but is parasitic on the existing theologies of existing communities, right? Because radical theologies need to ask the questions that confessional theologies won't ask. But to ask questions that they won't ask, the they there, confessional theologies, need to exist for radical theologians to ask the question. Then, if the radical theologians are not talking to the confessional theologians, they run the risk of only talking to themselves. In their effort to speak to everyone, they may well end up speaking to no one but themselves. <laughs> Impaneled on imponderable panels at annual meetings of the AAR. <laughs> he's taken a shot here. Um, and I think he's taken that shot um, at continental philosophers of religion who are only from his perspective, talking to one another while Caputo is being read, albeit by like nerds like me, uh, outside of people who are kind of specifically focused on the continental philosophy of religion. Like I go to church on Sunday. Uh, I believe some things. Uh, and I'm reading a book that has, um, wants to strike fear into the heart of, of belief. Uh, I don't know as if he's fully successful, like, uh, most folks in most churches uh, aren't going to read this and be able to, to penetrate it. I, I can't get all of it. Um, but he wants to matter. He's going into churches. He's preaching sometimes. He's having conversations. He's willing to have questions asked by anyone whether they know the jargon or not. And I think that that's part of what he wants to be doing. Um, he, he even goes so far as to kind of tip his hat a little bit. Uh, in regards to a conversation that he had. Um, here's a great passage that explains this. A philosopher friend of mine asked recently, can't you say everything you want by talking about being and finitude and never bringing up religion? The answer is, and th this is the crux of this whole book, I think, I could. But once we step outside of the academic building in which we're having this conversation, the massive cultural fact of religion is all around us and practically nobody out there is much interested in or moved by terms of art like being infinitude. Furthermore, whether we like it or not, the demands of truthfulness are such that we philosophers have to admit we have here crossed the threshold into a certain art or religion or religion without the trappings of religion, without the intrigues of the bishops and the costs of buying candles. Could this be done uh, without bringing religion into it? Says Caputo, yes. But in the interest of mattering to people beyond the academy, people who are uh, interested in candles and the trappings of bishops, there has to be another way to talk about this, a, talk, a way that bleeds into confessional theology. But if you start to bleed into confessional theology and adopt the propositional confessional theological mindset of confessional theology, then that, that trace, that haunting, that spook, that specter, the perhaps of radical theology has been left behind. So the only recourse available says Caputo, is to allow that spook to haunt you, the questions of the perhaps to bring you outside of where you feel comfortable and re-enter at least the edges, the liminal spaces, right? the, the eco-tone between where uh, radical theology and confessional theology overlap, and to proclaim your theology theopoetically in a, a discourse that doesn't rely on certainty, that doesn't rely on proof and proposition, that relies instead on ethics not through mandate, but through a poetics of obligation, through language that draws you forth in possibility, a possibility which never comes, but may always be arriving.
Well, at least that's my read of it. John D. Caputo, uh, The Insistence of God, A Theology of Perhaps?